This video is sponsored by Lord of the Rings Heroes of Middle-earth. More on that in a second. Hey squad, welcome back. Today I am listing Middle-earth's five most perfidious and false-hearted traitors. A key theme in The Lord of the Rings and other stories of Middle-earth is the power of loyalty and trust, whether it's between friends, family members, leaders and followers, or entire nations. The significance of this theme is often starkly contrasted with its opposite, the gut-wrenching horror of an unexpected betrayal. For every Sam, there's a Gollum. For every Fingon, a Feanor, and therefore to place your trust in anyone, always carries some risk. Loyalty is a deeply personal thing, of course, and the topic of treachery is subject to many fine shades of interpretation. So as always, bear in mind that this list is going to be somewhat subjective, and I look forward to some lively disputation in the comments. Finally, before we start discussing characters who put short-term material gain ahead of their personal integrity, let's take a moment to talk about this video's sponsor. The Lord of the Rings Heroes of Middle-Earth, a new CRPG from Capital Games and EA. Heroes of Middle-Earth lets you relive your favorite stories along with brand new ones, and you can collect both good and evil characters so you won't be forced to choose sides. The game's first Legendary Adventure event starts on June 26th. This is a limited time opportunity for players to upgrade their characters and unlock powerful Legendary characters who have unique abilities and upgraded visuals. Naturally, the one they're unveiling for this first event is Elrond. We all know he deserves to be first at least once, so I was very happy to see him at the top of their list, and yes, he seems to have grown his hair out for the occasion. Within the game, you can also sync his abilities with other characters, like his three children, Eladan and Elrahir in addition to Arwen, because one of the game's goals is to depict a lot of those lesser-known characters that don't often get featured in adaptations. In order to get Elrond during this event, though, you have to have collected five elven characters before the event starts on the 26th. So if this sounds like your jam, you can download Lord of the Rings Heroes of Middle-Earth for free using the link in the description or by scanning the QR code with your phone. If you miss out on this event, don't worry because there will be more characters to collect and some events may return in the future. Now, back to Betrayal. Number 5 is Meme the Petty Dwarf. Perhaps the treachery of Meme is not the most justified of the examples on this list, but it might be one of the more understandable ones. Meme's life is already so far from being good, even a run-in with Turin Turambar can't substantially worsen his position. He's one of the last remaining dwarves of the strange and sinister kind known as the Petty Dwarves, in origin, as was later known, descended from dwarves banished for evil deeds from the great mansions of their kind. The Petty Dwarves were the first of their kind, and apparently the first intelligent beings of any kind, to enter Beleriand. Rumor has it that at first they were hunted by the elves of that region until someone realized they were in fact not animals, but sentient people. Decidedly unsociable, resenting elves and orcs alike, they dwindle in number and strength until so few of them remain hardly anyone else even remembers their existence. According to one fragment recently published in The Nature of Middle-Earth, Meme the Petty Dwarf once dwelt with a remnant of his kin in their delvings on the bank of the river Narog. Later on, Finrod decides to establish his hidden realm of Nargothrond in these caverns, and in this labor he had at first help from the Petty Dwarves and their feigned friendship, for which he rewarded them generously until Meme their chieftain made an attempt to murder him in his sleep and was driven out into the wild. As far as I know, there is no additional context for this account. We next encounter Meme having made his home at Amonrud, another ancestral dwelling place of the Petty Dwarves, now empty except for Meme and his two sons, Him and Ibun. All too soon their empty nest becomes even emptier, because the three of them run afoul of Turin and his band of outlaws. The gang captures Meme and forces him to offer them shelter in exchange for his life. After he leads the group to his home, he learns his son Kim was wounded during the scuffle and has died. This sours Meme's attitude toward Turin's bandits even further, yet he remains bound by his agreement and must suffer them to live in his house. The outlaws, for their part, aren't too fond of their creepy host either. He always seems to be listening in on their conversations and makes no secret of his contempt for them, with one exception. 
Yet and strange it seemed to them, with Turin it went otherwise, and he became ever more friendly with the old dwarf and listened more and more to his counsels. Meme seemed well pleased and showed much favor to Turin in return. Him only would he admit to his smithy at times, and there they would talk softly together. Meme gets even saltier when Beleg shows up to offer his services. Now his resentment of the outlaws responsible for his son's death is magnified by his hatred and jealousy of the elf. According to some accounts, at this point Meme decides to betray the group to Morgoth, but in the published Silmarillion he's taken captive by a band of orcs who force him to trade information for his life, much like Turin's own band had done earlier. Then for a second time, Meme promised to guide his enemies by the secret paths to his home on Amon Ruth, but yet he sought to delay the fulfillment of his promise and demanded that Gorthal, that is Turin, should not be slain. Then the orc captain laughed, and he said to Meme, Assuredly, Turin, son of Hurin, shall not be slain. As is common, the agents of the enemy technically abide by their agreement in the course of committing a more heinous crime. After the slaughter of his band, Turin is taken alive by the orcs and dragged off toward Angband, where nothing good can possibly await him. Beleg manages to survive both the orc's assault and Meme's later attempt to finish him off, but Beleg being Beleg, he of course sets out to save his friend, which ultimately results in his death at Turin's hands, a tragedy I am quite comfortable laying partly at Meme's feet. After Turin slays the dragon Glaurung, Meme eventually finds his way to the ruins of Nargothrond, where he gloats over the dragon's treasure, until Turin's father Hurin finds him and finally dispenses a hearty helping of long overdue vengeance for Meme's treachery. Now, no one is claiming that Meme had it easy. It's certainly possible to sympathize with his situation. The last of his kind, forced to share his ancestral home with the troop of unwashed men responsible for his son's death, and displaced by one of the Sindarin elves who actively contributed to his people's near extinction. Even with all that, he does make a token attempt to spare Turin from the upcoming bloodbath. Still, I don't think anyone can argue that selling someone out to Morgoth's orcs, particularly when Morgoth has been asking around for that person, is anything less than a serious betrayal. Certainly, it's a violation of the agreement he worked out with Turin in exchange for his life. Couple that with a shadowy past that may or may not have involved assassination attempts on Noldoran royalty, and it seems that this guy's personal ethic is maybe not the strongest. His actions also result in Beleg nearly getting killed outright, and directly contribute to the circumstances of his actual death. Since Beleg is the greatest contribution to history that the Sindar ever made, that's not something I'm willing to let slide. Number 4 is Saruman. Saruman is accounted by many, most notably himself, to be the head of the Order of the Astari. His particular strength in opposing Sauron stems from his deep understanding of Sauron's techniques. However, Saruman's ring lore would ultimately contribute to his undoing. As Elrond later remarks, it is perilous to study too deeply the arts of the enemy, for good or for ill. Somewhere along the line, it seems, Saruman became convinced that he could not successfully oppose Sauron without adopting some of his methods. This led to him trying everything from leveraging centralized political power and amassing his own armies, to hunting for the One Ring himself, trying to make rings of his own, and ultimately deceit, assault, imprisonment, and poor forestry management. Sometime around the year 3000, after foolishly daring to experiment with the Palantir of Orthanc, he ends up having to reveal a lot of sensitive information to Sauron, and is forced to at least pretend to be on his side. But possibly for several decades prior to that, he'd already been actively deceiving the White Council, urging them to ignore any concerns about the ring being found or Sauron returning to power. In the meantime, he searches in secret and with increasing desperation for the ring, hoping to claim its power for himself. He also spies on Gandalf and the Shire and begins fortifying Orthanc. Saruman delays and imprisons Gandalf, infiltrates the Shire with his agents, breeds orcs and possibly half-orcs, works to paralyze Theoden's will with despair and terror, sends his Urukai to kidnap the hobbits, with Boromir as an unfortunate casualty, and ultimately attempts to conquer Rohan, which would have left Minas Tirith to face Sauron's assault unaided. Saruman is notable for the passion with which he once served the cause he ends up betraying. He's managed to convince himself that he hasn't really switched sides. He tells Gandalf, for instance, that everything he's doing is still in service to his original aims. A new power is rising, against it the old allies and policies will not avail us at all. We may join with that power. There is hope that way. Its victory is at hand, and there will be rich reward for those that aided it. 
As the power grows, its proved friends will also grow, and the wise, such as you and I, may with patience come at last to direct its courses, to control it. There need not be, there would not be, any real change in our designs, only in our means. Even in this pretty-sounding prepared speech, it's made quite clear to both the reader and to Saruman's audience that his real aim is to increase his own power and status. The fervency with which Saruman clings to his transparent justification for his actions is a faded echo of his original sincere conviction, which makes his abandonment of the very mission he claims to be upholding all the more surprising. After the fall of Sauron, Saruman descends into hysterical, petty spitefulness. His plans are easily thwarted by a gang of halflings who have gone far too long without a good smoke, he's killed by his erstwhile partner in crime Grima, and the histories remember him not as a powerful, noble leader, but as a faithless and contemptible failure. Saruman the White fell from his high errand, and becoming proud and impatient and enamored of power, sought to have his own will by force and to oust Sauron, but he was ensnared by that dark spirit mightier than he. Number 3 is Gollum. One of the most famous tragic characters from The Lord of the Rings, Gollum is certainly pitiable in some respects. However, even before his run-in with Frodo, it's clear that he's not a very nice person, prepared as he is to murder, lie, steal, and manipulate to increase his own power and satisfy his own desires. We will leave aside for a moment the question of his conduct during the riddle game with Bilbo, which, while deceitful and sinister, doesn't exactly constitute treachery. His falling out with his former friend Deagle, though likewise reprehensible, is also more a crime of passion than a premeditated betrayal. During his desperate wanderings in search of Baggins of the Shire and his unlawfully gotten precious, Gollum enters Mordor and encounters Shelob, whom he worships as a sort of loathsome deity. Captured and tortured by Sauron, he reveals what he knows of the Ring to buy his freedom, but like Saruman, Gollum's real purpose is to buy time to find the Ring and claim it for himself. After he escapes the custody of the Mirkwood Elves, he hides in Moria, where he later encounters the Fellowship. He follows them south until Sam and Frodo leave the company, which finally gives him a chance to attack them. Luckily, the hobbits knew he was on their trail and overpower him. Frodo takes pity on Gollum and refrains from killing him, but this leaves the hobbits in something of a pickle, as letting him go free isn't a great idea either. The hobbits need his help, but can't trust him to give it. The solution they hit on is for Gollum to swear by the ring itself to serve the Master of the Precious and to keep the ring from Sauron. Frodo points out that while this promise is a binding one, and the only one Gollum can make that the hobbits can believe, the power of the ring will twist Gollum's words. Nevertheless, for a while, this promise seems to work. From that moment, a change, which lasted for some time, came over him. He spoke with less hissing and whining, and he spoke to his companions direct, not to his precious self. He would cringe and flinch if they stepped near him or made any sudden movement, but he was friendly and indeed pitifully anxious to please. Alas, the pull of the ring is strong, and after Faramir's men take Gollum captive, something Frodo appeared complicit in, Gollum concludes that he can technically fulfill this promise by leading the hobbits through Kirith Ungol and allowing Shelob to dispatch them, after which Gollum would of course be justified, if not outright obligated, to retrieve the ring. Though he does struggle with this decision in the face of Frodo's continued compassion, ultimately he follows through with this plan. However, both Sam and Frodo survive Shelob, after which point Gollum continues to stalk them and finally openly attacks them as they climb the slopes of Mount Doom. Frodo and Sam spare him again on the condition that he leave them alone. He agrees, but continues to secretly follow them, making one final attempt to get his hands on the ring at the very crack of Doom itself. Whether through fate, chance, or the consequences of his own broken, twisted vow, made on his treacherous and duplicitous precious, he topples into the fire the moment he reclaims it. It's not that surprising that Gollum eventually takes the ring. According to Tolkien's later letters, Gollum is already so tightly bound by its power that even if he had sincerely tried to help Frodo to the utmost of his ability, it's almost certain he would have tried to get it at some point. What makes this betrayal so significant, to me at least, is how pathetic it is. Frodo is the one person in centuries who has bothered to not only spare Gollum's life, but truly give him the benefit of the doubt and even trust him as far as that's possible. Even wise and kindly characters like Aragorn, Faramir, and Gandalf treat Gollum somewhat roughly and hold out very little hope for the restoration of his character. But Frodo deals with him fairly, takes responsibility for him, and offers him kindness and encouragement. And Gollum clearly knows how valuable that is. 
after 500 years as the undisputed master of the precious, which he mostly spent under the mountains talking to himself and munching goblins, he has plenty of first-hand experience to suggest that owning the One Ring may not be all it's cracked up to be. Gandalf says that he'd become so miserable that even Bilbo's intrusion was a welcome change of pace. There was a little corner of his mind that was still his own, and light came through it as through a chink in the dark, light out of the past. It was actually pleasant, I think, to hear a kindly voice again, bringing up memories of wind and trees and sun on the grass and such forgotten things. Even as Gollum decides to reclaim his precious and gleefully plots his revenge on Sam, part of him balks at the thought of harming Frodo, albeit indirectly. Yet in the end, his petty resentments and self-aggrandizing delusions are enough for him to break his promise and forsake Frodo, a betrayal that only serves to lead him to his own doom. Number two is the House of Ulfang. In First Stage Beleriand, some generations after the initial arrival of the Edain and following the Dagor Bragalach, a second wave of mortal migration from the east resulted in numerous new tribes arriving in the region. Notable among them were the people of Bor, whose sons were Borlach, Borlad, and Borthond, and the people of Ulfang, with his sons Ulfast, Ulwarth, and Uldor. Following the precedent set by the major houses of the Edain, these newcomers proceeded to enter the service of the nearest available Noldoran lords, and since all the cool ones like Fingon and Finrod were already taken, this left the Sons of Feanor as their only option. Said Feanorians just so happened to be planning a great unified assault on Morgoth and were perhaps a little too eager to accept new vassals. In any case, the screening process for new hires seems to have been radically insufficient. Boar's people entered the service of Mithras and Maglor, while Ulfing's house takes up with Karanthir. In case it isn't obvious yet from the context of this video, the respective titles by which these eastern lords eventually become known make matters pretty clear. Boar is known as the Faithful in the histories, while Ulfang earns the distinction of the Black, and one of his sons, Uldor, is known as the Accursed, a title you really have to work hard to earn in a universe that contains multiple children of Hurin. In an absolutely shocking twist, it turns out Morgoth has been hard at work subverting the loyalties of these clans. Bor remains faithful to his new self-accursed Eldaran overlords, but even after swearing allegiance to the Feanorians, Ulfang and his brood secretly work for Morgoth. The treachery of the House of Ulfang helps to doom the union of Mithros before it even gets fully underway. Morgoth was warned of the uprising of the Eldar and the Elf Friends, and took counsel against them, many spies and workers of treason he sent forth among them, as he was the better able now to do for the faithless men of his secret allegiance were yet deep in the secrets of the Sons of Feanor. However, this treachery only comes to light during the Fifth Battle. First, Uldor delays Mithros' march with fake news, and then as his armies finally arrive at the site of the main action, Ulfang's sons turn on the Feanorians from behind while their hidden allies suddenly attack from the eastern hills. This surprise attack prevents the Feanorian army from reaching the western host of the Noldoran army, which includes High King Fingon and his vassals Hurin and Huor, and leaves them stranded in an ocean of orcs with wolves, balrogs, and dragons thrown in for good measure. The battle ends in disaster, the north of Beleriand is entirely overrun, Fingon is slain, Hurin is taken captive, and the sons of Feanor are put to rout, still decidedly lacking either vengeance or Silmarils. The outcome of this battle contributes to the mistrust between elves and men for ages to come. Great was the triumph of Morgoth, and his design was accomplished in a manner after his own heart, for men took the lives of men, and betrayed the Eldar, and fear and hatred were aroused among those that should have been united against him. From that day the hearts of the elves were estranged from men. We know very little of Uldor, Ulfast, and Ulwarth apart from their nefarious role in Morgoth's most decisive victory, but we have some hints as to their possible motivations. While some tribes of men were outright summoned to Beleriand by Morgoth, many others were simply drawn by the promise of fertile land and lucrative trade. This makes the outcome of their treachery fittingly ironic, because not only are the sons of Ulfang themselves slain in battle, Uldor by Maglor himself, and the other two by the faithful sons of Bor, but their people are never allowed the rich reward that Morgoth pledged to them. Morgoth sent the Easterlings that had served him to Heathlum, denying them the rich lands of Beleriand which they coveted, and he shut them in Heathlum and forbade them to leave it. Such was the reward he gave them for their treachery to Mithros, to plunder and harass the old and the women and the children of Hador's people. By seeking their own house's prosperity at the expense of the freedom and well-being of every other inhabitant of Beleriand, Ulfang and his faithless sons only end up trapping their people in a life of fear, constraint, and poverty. Number one is Maeglin. 
This really shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone, you know I have to put Maeglin at the top. Among the Eldar, his name is synonymous with the vilest of betrayals, and in one note he is given the dubious distinction of the only elf to ever willingly collude with Morgoth. Maeglin is the nephew of King Turgon, who dwelt in Gondolin after the messiest custody battle, and yes we do mean battle, Elvendom had ever seen. Quick-witted and silver-tongued, he garners favor among the Gondolindrim, but he is haunted by his unrequited love for his cousin Idril, and consumed with ambition. Straying too far from the vicinity of Gondolin one day in search of oars, he's discovered and captured by a band of orcs. Accounts vary as to whether he was brought unwillingly to Angband or if he proactively offered to trade his life for information. Regardless, at some point he agreed to reveal the location of the Hidden Kingdom to Morgoth. In return, not only would he avoid unfathomable torment, but Morgoth promised him first dibs on Idril, who we should note is at this point a married woman with a child. For what it's worth, he also gets to be a captain of Morgoth's orcs and king of Gondolin, but it's hard to see what exactly is appealing about being king of a destroyed city whose people have all been slaughtered or enslaved. Not only does Maeglin give Morgoth all the details he needs about Gondolin's location, defenses, and how best to attack it, he then returns to Gondolin and pretends that everything is fine, at the command of Morgoth who by now has terrified him into complete submission. When the requisite hordes of Balrogs appear on the horizon, he sees his chance to claim what he wants, and abandons any effort to defend the city or even help out his new allies. Instead, he makes a beeline for Idril and commences with dragging her away. According to the most complete version of this story, his plans for a romantic elopement include forcing his new, uh, bride? To watch as he throws her son off the city walls. But luckily, her husband Tour arrives in time to put a stop to this, and Maeglin ends up falling to his death instead. Now, in Maeglin's defense, he's had a very rough childhood that at least gives some context for why he is… the way he is. From a psychological perspective, his decisions show a twisted but compelling kind of logic. You could also argue that he didn't set out to betray his home, and that being under the threat of death or torture makes his consent questionable. But even this faint defense is problematic. Maeglin is only captured in the first place because he's ventured beyond the boundaries of what his uncle, the King, allows, searching for ores he can use to maintain his high standing as one of Gondolin's master smiths. In the older tale, Maeglin responds well to Morgoth's flattery, and is very excited at the prospect of murdering Arendil and possessing Idril. He even gives constructive feedback on Morgoth's plans, advising him on the design of new war devices to best assail the city's high walls. Overall, the version of the story published in The Silmarillion paints a more favorable picture of Maeglin than the earliest versions, emphasizing instead his fear of the tortures Morgoth threatened him with. Even in this more sympathetic take, though, Maeglin's jealous longing for Idril is a central element to his vulnerability before Morgoth's persuasions. Maeglin was no weakling or craven, but the torment wherewith he was threatened cowed his spirit, and he purchased his life and freedom by revealing to Morgoth the very place of Gondolin and the ways whereby it might be found and assailed. Great indeed was the joy of Morgoth, and to Maeglin he promised the lordship of Gondolin as his vassal, and the possession of Idril Celebrindol when the city should be taken. And indeed, desire for Idril and hatred for Tuor led Maeglin the easier to his treachery, most infamous in all the histories of the Elder Days. So as fun as Maeglin might be to psychoanalyze, there's no avoiding the conclusion that his life was divined by a staggering act of self-centered betrayal. Moreover, at this point in history, Gondolin is the last surviving elven kingdom that Morgoth hasn't overrun, so by handing it over to him, Maeglin is destroying the last faint hope of the entire continent. That's a long way to go to get a girl's attention. Honorable mention goes to Feanor. Stealing the swan ships out from under his half-brother's nose is undeniably a jerk move. But it's arguably not really that much of a betrayal as such, because there is no textual evidence that he ever harbored so much as a scrap of sympathy for his half-siblings or their followers. Feanor has only ever been loyal to Feanor. Grima, like a slimier discount Maeglin. Enough said. Baragond. After years of unquestioning obedience to Denethor, he leaves his post and forsakes his duties even to the point of killing his fellow soldiers on the hallowed ground of the Silent Street. The fact that such a betrayal of his lord's trust was morally demanded in this instance makes it no less treacherous. Huon. Naturally, Huon is still the bestest of all possible boys, and no one could deserve betrayal more richly than late-stage Kelegorm, but it is still a big deal for a dog to turn on his person. And the One Ring itself. 
seducing people only to slide off their fingers when they most need it, addling the wits of even its own maker with its devastating allure. The One Ring isn't even loyal to the hand that wields it. When even Gorthang is a less faithless, inanimate object, you know you've gone too far. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button like its ancestors mounted and displayed your ancestors' beards on their walls. Consider subscribing. That is, if you haven't already given your wholehearted allegiance to some other channel. Thank you to everyone for watching, and special thanks to my loyal patrons who keep this channel alive, especially Kevin Gilstad, Brent Gaines, Gandalf the Grey, Marcel Ribeiro, Nick Riallo, Chris Nichols, Jeremy Buckingham, Bitso Bongo, Dorwin Gray, John Love, Brendan Mooney, E. Rose B., Allison Kreutzberg, Frankie Twelve String, Tamara Saldana, Luke, Joel Bion, Rogue Hot Pocket, and Jared Carver.